Lagrange's equations are invariant under a change in generalized coordinates. And so we can introduce a point transformation of the configuration space of the form. Q sub j is defined as a function of all of our generalized coordinates, Q1 through Qn, and time. And it should be noted here that this capital Q is not a generalized force, it is a new coordinate. This is known as a point transformation, and what we're looking for is a point transformation of the phase space under which Hamilton's equations are invariant. That is, we wish to define a new set of coordinates q sub j that are functions of the generalized coordinates, their conjugate momenta and time, and a set of new conjugate momenta, capital P, which are similarly a function of the full phase space and time of the original system. Assuming that these two are invertible, we should also be able to write functions for the original generalized coordinate, the lowercase q sub j's, as functions of capital Q and capital P in time, and similarly, functions of the original conjugate momenta, the lowercase p's, as functions of Q capital and P capital in time. What we're looking for is a new set of Hamilton's equations. So the capital Q sub j dot is equal to the partial of some new Hamiltonian k with respect to the conjugate momenta P sub j, and similarly, the time derivative of the, that conjugate momenta is negative the partial of that new Hamiltonian k with respect to its generalized coordinate, capital Q sub j. And this new Hamiltonian k should be written as the original Hamiltonian as a function of the transformations of the phase space of the mappings from the lowercase q and p to the uppercase q and p and time. Recall Hamilton's principle. Hamilton's principle stated that the trajectory of our system was a stationary point of the action, which was the integral from the time t1 to t2 of the Lagrangian of the system. And if you recall how we defined the Hamiltonian originally via that Legendre transformation, you'll see that this expression is exactly equivalent to the Lagrangian. That means that for our new transformation of the phase space, we can equivalently write that the variation in the integral between times t1 and t2 of the new conjugate momenta capital P dotted into the new generalized coordinates capital Q time derivative minus our new Hamiltonian k will all equal zero. At this point, we note that we can add a derivative of any arbitrary function f to either of these two integrands so long as it vanishes at the endpoints at t1 and t2. This was a key aspect of how we originally derived the Euler Lagrange equations from Hamilton's principle. So, therefore, if the integral of the time derivative of some function f between t1 and t2 is equal to zero, then we can slap this on top of this integrand without changing these equations at all. And so, in general, we can write that is the Lagrangian of our original system given by p dotted into q dot minus h times an arbitrary scale constant, which without loss of generality can be taken to equal one, is the same as the dot product of our new conjugate momenta dotted into the time derivatives of our new generalized coordinates minus our new Hamiltonian plus the time derivative of this arbitrary function f, so long as this function f vanishes at the endpoints t1 and t2. f is called a generating function, and it specifies the form of the transformation. So let's consider an example. We will take the generating function f1 to be a function of the original generalized coordinates, the transformed to generalized coordinates, and time. And therefore, the original Lagrangian must be equal to the new Lagrangian plus the time derivative of this f1. The time derivative itself can be written as the partial of the generating function f1 with respect to time, plus the partial with respect to the original generalized coordinates dotted with their time derivative, plus the partial of f1 with respect to the transformed generalized coordinates dotted with their time derivative. If we rearrange things in this expression, we can write, that is the original conjugate momenta minus the partial of the generating function with respect to the original generalized coordinates, all dotted into the time derivative of the original generalized coordinates must be equal to the new conjugate momenta 
plus the partial of the generating function with respect to the new generalized coordinates dotted into the time derivative of the new generalized coordinates plus the original Hamiltonian minus the transformed Hamiltonian plus the partial of the generating function with respect to time. And what we've done is taking the definition of this time derivative of the generating function, plug it in here, and then rearranging into dot products of lowercase q dot and uppercase q dot as follows. We now have three terms here, here, and here that must each vanish independently in order for Hamilton's equations to hold as each of the lowercase q sub i's and each of the uppercase q sub i's are separately independent. And therefore, we can write the ith original canonical momenta must be equal to the partial of the generating function with respect to the original generalized coordinate. The transformed conjugate momenta must be equal to negative the partial of the generating function with respect to the ith transformed generalized coordinate. And the new Hamiltonian k must be equal to the original Hamiltonian plus the partial of the generating function with respect to time. And this expression will be the same for all possible generating functions. And these two will depend on the specific form of the generating function that we assumed. We can now take these expressions and find the inversions of them that give us, that is expressions for the transformed generalized coordinates as functions of the original generalized coordinates and their conjugate momenta in time, and the new conjugate momenta as functions of the original generalized coordinates, the transformed generalized coordinates, and time. And that gives us the full transformation of our equations of motion. There are four basic generating function types that we can define. F1 that we just looked at is the generating function that's a function of the original and transformed generalized coordinates. F2 is a function of the original generalized coordinate and the transformed momenta. F3 is the original conjugate momenta and, a and the transformed generalized coordinate. And F4 is a function of the original and transformed canonical momenta. And here are the classical forms. Here are the transformations, all derived in exactly the same way that we got the transformations for the uh, first case, F1. And here's an example, uh, in some cases kind of trivial, but this is a basic example of each of these. So for example, a function of Q dotted into capital Q is an example of the first class of generating function. You can also mix and match types and create composite generating functions built up out of multiple ones of these. So what is the utility here? Our whole motivation for developing the formalism of canonical transformations is that we seek a transformation where the Hamiltonian is independent of both the coordinates and the momentum and is therefore constant. In this case, all of the phase space values are constants of motion and the system is completely integrable. And so of course, not all Hamiltonian systems were going to be completely integrable, but central force motion, which is something that we care deeply about, is the classic example of this type of system. What we're looking for is a transformation such that each of our resulting differential equations, capital Q sub J dot equal to partial K with respect to capital P sub J, P sub J dot equal to negative partial K with respect to capital Q sub J, and k, which is h plus the partial of our generating function with respect to time, we want all of these to equal zero. We therefore want all of the capital Qs and all of the capital Ps to be constants in time. To accomplish this, we're going to use the second class of generating functions given on the previous slide. So we will use a generating function F2, that is a function of the original generalized coordinates, the transformed momenta and time minus the dot product of the transformed coordinates with their momenta. In this case, we find that the original conjugate momenta are given by the partials of the generating function with respect to the original generalized coordinates. The transformed generalized coordinates are the partial of the generating function with respect to the transformed conjugate momenta. And we have this relationship for the Hamiltonian and the partial of the generating function with respect to time. This expression here is what is known as the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. This is a partial differential equation in n plus one variables, where the original system was a system of n degrees of freedom, 
And it's not always going to be solvable. But in the case where it is, it gives us a completely new way of expressing the equations of motion of the system. We're going to call this F2 generating function a function S. And S, which is a function of the original generalized coordinates, the transformed canonical momenta, which we will call now alpha, and time, this is known as Hamilton's principal function. And it is the solution to the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. The reason why we're going through the rigmarole of renaming things is just to constantly keep in mind that this is a very special system that we're setting up. This is a very special canonical transformation, one where all of the transformed conjugate momenta are constants of motion. And so that's why we're renaming the P sub i's to these alpha sub i's. But they serve exactly the same purposes they did before, just in this case, they are constant. And similarly, we are going to rename all of our transformed generalized coordinates, q sub i's, to be called beta sub i, where again, the betas are all constants of motion, because that is the point of this endeavor. The Hamilton-Jacobi formulation is one where all of the variables of the phase space are themselves constant. As before, the original conjugate momenta are partials of our generating function, what we're now calling S with respect to the original generalized coordinates. And our transform generalized coordinates, the new constants that we're calling betas, are going to be partials of that same S function with respect to these alpha constants. The Hamilton-Jacobi formulation maps the n second order ordinary differential equations of the original system that we get from Newton's or Lagrange's approach to the 2n first order ordinary differential equations that we get from the Hamiltonian approach to a single first order differential equation. Furthermore, we note that the time derivative of our generating function s can be written as the partial of s with respect to the original generalized coordinates dotted into their time derivatives plus the partial of s with respect to time. And this is equal to the original conjugate momenta dotted into the original generalized coordinates minus the original Hamiltonian, which is the Lagrangian of the system. And so S is the action. If the Hamiltonian of the system is independent of time, if the Hamiltonian itself is a constant of motion, then we can write the generating function S, which is a function of the original generalized coordinates, the transformed conjugate momenta, which we're now calling alpha, to remind us that there are constants of motion, and time, if the Hamiltonian is time independent, this all becomes a function W, that is a function of the generalized coordinates and the transformed conjugate momenta only, minus some constant of integration, alpha one times time. And this W is known as Hamilton's characteristic function. In this case, the Hamiltonian, which is independent of time and a function of the generalized coordinates and the conjugate momenta, which we can give as the partial of the generating function with respect to the original generalized coordinates, is itself constant and therefore is equal to negative the partial of s with respect to time, which is the same as this alpha one term. And therefore, the entirety of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation becomes the Hamiltonian expressed as a function of the generalized coordinates, the partial of Hamilton's characteristic function with respect to the original generalized coordinates is equal to the constant alpha one. And we can separate the generating function as S is now a function S naught of that constant alpha one in time, plus some function S prime of the generalized coordinates and the transformed conjugate momenta, which is the same as Hamilton's characteristic function minus the constant alpha one times time. Hamilton's characteristic function, w, is therefore itself a generating function. And we can therefore write the original conjugate momenta, p sub i, as partials of w with respect to the original generalized coordinates, q sub i, and the transformed coordinates, capital Q sub i, as the partials of w with respect to the conjugate momenta, alpha sub i, which themselves are constants. We thus have the transformed Hamiltonian, which is a function of the transformed generalized coordinates and conjugate momenta, is equal to the original Hamiltonian, which is a function of the original generalized coordinates and conjugate momenta. These are both time independent based on our assumptions, plus the partial of the generating function W with respect to time, which is zero, because it too is in independent of time, 
and this is all equal to that constant alpha one. In general, only systems where the Hamilton-Jacobi equations are easily solved are ones where W is going to be completely separable. But these are the kinds of systems that we're most interested in, where we can write, that is those where the W function can be written as the sum of some W1, that is a function of the first generalized coordinate only and the transformed conjugate momenta, plus W2, that is a function of the original Q2 and the alpha I all the way through some function Wn, which is a function of Q sub N and all of the alpha I's. When we can do this, the Hamilton-Jacobi equation reduces to N first order ODEs and we get these N first order differential equations of the form H sub I, that is a function of QI, the partial of WI with respect to QI and all of the alphas is equal to alpha I for I from one to N. We care about all of this tedious formalism because central force motion is the classical example of the type of system that behaves really well and for which these kinds of transformations give us very useful equations. For general applications of Hamilton-Jacobi, the K will be zero. Here, K is set to this alpha one, this original constant equal to the original Hamiltonian. All of the coordinates and momenta are cyclic. And so we retain this property that we wanted that the time derivatives of the transformed conjugate momenta, which are the partials of the transformed Hamiltonian with respect to the transformed generalized coordinates is zero. And these P sub i's are all equivalent to the constants of motion alpha sub i's. What we've gained is that the new Hamiltonian depends on just one momenta, just on that alpha one. And so in the final form of applying the Hamilton-Jacobi equation to this type of fully integrable system, we can write the time derivatives of the transformed generalized coordinates are the partials of the transformed Hamiltonian with respect to the transformed conjugate momenta, alpha sub i, but they will be zero for all i other than i equal to one, and they will be exactly one in the case where i is equal to one. Integrating this, we therefore have the transformed generalized coordinate q sub i in the case where i is equal to one is equal to time plus beta one, the generalized coordinate constant of motion, which is equivalent to the partial of Hamilton's characteristic function, which is our generating function with respect to that constant alpha one. And for all other cases, for all other coordinates, Q sub I is equivalent to beta sub I, which is the partial of the generating function with respect to alpha sub I. This all seems monstrously, enormously ornate and complex without any real clear payoff. So let's now actually apply this to central force motion and see what we gain from all of this. And we're going to start with a simplified case where we're only gonna treat central motion in two dimensions.